happy to be here. Uh, excited to, to talk to you guys all a little bit about technology and farming. Uh, my name is Irving Fain. I am the CEO and founder of Bowery Farming. And today I'm going to talk a little bit about the intersection and the intertwining of technology and farming over many decades, many generations, and ultimately what's led us to implement artificial intelligence across all of our farms at Bowery and really think about farming for the future. So, as a starting point, what I want to do is talk a little bit about who is Bowery, who are we, what are we building, but even more so, why are we building it? And I think everybody here is probably familiar with the fact that we have a ever-changing and quickly changing world. Uh, in the next 30 years, by 2050, according to the UN, we're going to have somewhere between 9 and 10 billion people on the planet. So an enormous amount of population. Uh, and at the same time, we're going to need somewhere between 50 to 70 percent more food to feed that growing population, according to the same UN study. All the while, somewhere between 70 and 80 percent of our population is going to be living in and around cities. So you've got a major move towards urbanization. Now, what makes this particularly challenging is the fact that we have an agricultural system which is already being substantially stretched today. Agriculture is actually the largest consumer of resources globally by an enormous margin. So we use about 70% of the world's water every single year just on agriculture. In the US alone, we put down about 700 million pounds of pesticides annually. Globally, when you look at that number, it's actually closer to 5 billion pounds of pesticides. And the challenge with that, as you would imagine, is that is destroying the topsoil layer that we rely on to grow the food that we need. That's getting into the soil, that's getting into the water supply, and the streams and lakes and rivers and our oceans. And that's on the food that we're eating and that our children and our families are eating. Now, what makes this even more complicated is that over time, in order to handle this complex farming system that we've developed to feed an increasingly large population, we've built a very large, complex, and quite fragmented supply chain. We need a way to move food around from where it's being grown to where we all actually live and need to eat it. But the challenge of this supply chain is, first and foremost, there's a lot of cost that's embedded to take food from where it's being grown to us. Secondly, though, there's a lot of waste. There's some estimates that say up to 40% of fresh food is actually lost from the time in the field to the actual distribution points. On top of it, there's a lot of time that transpires from when you actually harvest a product to when it lands on where it actually needs to go. It's anywhere between weeks of time and in some cases even months of time before we get the fresh produce that we're actually eating from when it was actually grown. And all the while, we have an enormous amount of risk for foodborne illness. I'm sure all of you guys saw many different news stories over the course of the last year. Just last year, there were more instances of foodborne illness in that year than we've seen in the last prior decade. So there's a problem on this side. And then on the other side of it, we're losing nutrition. Up to 50% of our nutrition in our fresh food is actually lost in the time when it's harvested to actually where it gets to where it's going. Shelf life suffers because of all the time that elapses. And in the end of the day, when we ask questions like, where's our food grown? Where is it coming from? How is it grown? What was put on my food? The supply chain that we've developed actually just does not have answers for these questions. Now, fortunately, there are answers to these problems. And that is exactly what we're building at Bowery. This is local indoor farming that can be done at scale. So what does that actually mean? So at Bowery, what we build is large commercial scale indoor farms. And we grow our food stacked under lights from the floor all the way to the ceiling. So first and foremost, we're using the cubic space of a, of a room like this much more efficiently than you ever would if you grew in a single horizontal layer. But on top of it, we grow in a completely controlled, completely contained environment. And so that means we can grow 365 days of the year completely independent of weather and seasonality. So that's reliable, consistent supply of fresh produce year round, which essentially is a departure from 10,000 years of agriculture in its own right. On top of that, though, we grow completely pesticide-free product. 
So we use no pesticides, no insecticides, no fungicides, no herbicides. Our food is as pure and clean as you can find. And the challenge when you do this in the field is first of all, your quality suffers substantially, but secondly, you see your yields drop precipitously. In our case, not only do we grow the purest and the best produce that you can find, but we actually can grow more than twice as fast as the field. We get more crop cycles out of the year than the field does, and we get more yield per crop cycle. So we end up over 100 times plus more productive than a square foot of farmland, and all the while, we save over 95% of the water when we grow. It is a completely new way to think about farming. So one of the questions I get asked understandably all the time is, I don't understand why this wasn't done before. Why is this making sense and why are people doing this now? And there's an easy first place to start to answer that question and that's trends around LED lighting. So fortunately for our sakes and fortunately for the consumers who actually eat our produce every day, we are far from the first people to grow food under lights. In fact, this has been happening for decades. The government and their labs are doing this. NASA was actually growing produce in the early 80s so they could figure out how are we gonna feed fresh food to an interplanetary species. Universities, their labs have been doing this. The problem was the lights that were being used were very, very expensive and the efficiency of those lights was very poor. So you could grow food, it was just way out of the money. It was essentially a research-driven endeavor. And that was the case for quite some time until about eight years ago when everything changed. The cost of the lights dropped by over 85% and the efficiency of those same lights more than doubled. And that meant that for the first time, what was really only a research-driven endeavor could actually be done in a commercially viable way. And for us, what's even more exciting is that trend actually continues. The same tailwind that got us here today will continue for quite some time. And we'll see another 50 to 85% drop in the cost of our lights and another doubling of efficiency. Now, what we realized at Bowery very early was that the lights were important and they made indoor farming viable. But what they did not do is make indoor farming scalable. And scalable to us means how do you grow large amounts of food consistently at a high quality and at prices that actually open up a large market opportunity? To do that, you need more than lights. And that's why we leverage innovation that's happened in robotics and automation, innovation that's happened in artificial intelligence and computer vision, the decline in the cost of sensors, as well as the decline in the cost of just storing and processing data. And at Bowery, we take all of those trends and we put that together with the LED lighting trend and we use that to think about what is the future of agriculture going to look like for the coming generations. So what I want to do is take a step back, take a step way back actually, and look at the history of farming and the history of agriculture to sort of understand how we got to where we are today. Now, there are better shepherds for this journey than myself, so I want to use somebody that we'll call Farmer Tom. He's not a shepherd as in he has sheep. He'll be our guide through this journey. And we're going to start with Farmer Tom 10,000 years ago. So, so why 10,000 years? Well, 10,000 years for those who know about the agricultural revolution was a really important time because Tom, prior to that, his relatives to eat, they had got to hunt, they would have to forage, they would have to travel around. They essentially moved to find the food sources that sustained them. And about 10,000 years ago, Tom and his friends began to realize, hey, we can actually control the land somewhat, and we can farm in one place. And so if we can farm in one place, we don't have to move around all the time, and we can begin to build a community that does stay in one place. But farming for Farmer Tom was a pretty rudimentary endeavor. He had seeds, he would plant them based on whether the land was good or not, he would plant them based on the weather and the water conditions, and he would grow his food. And he would probably look at his crops and he would see some of his crops grew better than others, some of his crops tasted better than others, and he would harvest those seeds and he would use those seeds to plant again. But his ability to change and evolve and use technology at that point was very, very limited. However, the world did keep evolving for Farmer Tom. And over time, Farmer Tom began to use tools. They were very rudimentary and very simple tools. He could, he could till the ground a little bit. He could dig up nutrients. It was very simplified. He could even dig trenches for irrigation. Then he began to domesticate animals and he could use 
cattle and he could use oxen and he could use horses. And what this meant was Tom as an individual now could actually farm a larger piece of land. And that meant that Tom could support a larger and larger community. His technology innovation continued for really thousands and thousands of years until we reach the early 1900s when something important happens. Tom gets a gas-powered tractor. And this is a similar importance as we saw when we got gas-powered cars. Because what this meant for Tom was now for the first time, Tom on his tractor could not only do more with the land, but as an individual could farm much more land than he'd ever been possibly able to before. And so he could feed more people again as an individual. And that tractor technology, similar to the way our cars changed, continued to change. It continued to iterate and it continued to evolve. And so we fast forward past World War II. The popula population begins to explode and the questions start to come up about how are we gonna feed this exploding and growing population? And so Farmer Tom, whose tractor, as you can see, looks quite different than it did in the early 1900s, begins to say there's only so much I can do with the tools that I have. So the agricultural system looks elsewhere. And we begin to say, well, there's all these externalities, all these variables that I can't control. Maybe we use chemicals. And so we start using fertilizer. And we start using nitrogen. And we start putting pesticides down and herbicides and fungicides so that the pests don't get at his crops. And then Tom even starts to change the genetics of the seeds themselves. Because he says, well, I can't stop drought from happening. So if I create drought-resistant seeds, that at least helps me. This worked for Tom, and it continued to progress. However, while we were mass producing cheap food, there was a cost to our practices. In just the last 40 years, we have actually lost 30% of all of our arable farmland globally. And that is because we are farming in a chemically intensive, monocropping, industrialized way. We are destroying the very topsoil layer that we rely on to grow food. And we are leaching these chemicals not only into the soil, but into our waterways. And we're seeing issues in waterways all across the world. And so Tom began to realize that while the food was cheap, there was a cost to what he was doing. And this is where technology began to kick in again. And we realized there was ways to leverage not only technology, but artificial intelligence to make farming smarter and to make farming better. Now we use satellite images and drones that we pair with machine learning to understand what's happening with Tom's field. Where does he need more nitrogen? Where does he need more water? Where is he having pest issues that he wants to put chemicals down? Companies like Blue River Technology, which was acquired by John Deere a couple years ago, leverage computer vision and artificial intelligence to work in the lettuce fields and not only thin lettuce, but actually kill weeds so that they could only apply the pesticides where it was needed instead of blanketing a field and just hoping you captured everything that you actually needed. Precision agriculture has been very effective. It is a good step forward for the system, but ultimately it is not enough. And the problem is persisting and the problem is actually growing faster than we can solve it. And that is why we are building what we are at Bowery. So let's imagine that Farmer Tom could completely change the paradigm. For 10,000 years, what Tom has essentially been doing is adapting his farming practices to the world around him that he cannot control. But what if Tom could bring his farm inside? And what if Tom could actually control all of these variables that he's been trying to respond to for the last 10,000 years? That is exactly what we have at Bowery. And the centerpiece for that control is what we call the Bowery operating system. So the Bowery OS is the brains of our farm. It is the central nervous system of what we do. And the first thing that it does is it takes millions of data points in real time and ingests that data in through a sensor and control system that we've developed. And that data tells us things about the health of our crops, the quality, how they're growing, the look and feel, even taste and flavor, and certainly yield. That data gets ingested into our system and analyzed. But additionally, we have a whole plant vision system that we've built. And we're taking images of our crops in real time. And we run those images through deep learning algorithms that we've developed. And we can look and say, what's happening to this crop right now? But also then predict forward and say, based on everything we know and everything we've seen, what's going to happen to this crop in the future? 
And then all that data, all that understanding about our crop gets run through other machine learning algorithms and we say, okay, what tweaks and changes to the environment do we want to make? And those changes get pushed out and automatically made in our system, all without any human beings being involved. We don't need to rely on Tom's intuition. We don't need to rely on Tom's presence or his understanding. And we can iterate at a recursive learning loop that's never been possible in agriculture before. But the battery operating system goes even deeper. Not only does it control all of the systems across our farm itself, but it actually goes all the way down to the work management layer. And it helps our farmers know what to do, when to do it, where to do it, how to do it. So a farmer at Bowery does not need to have decades of prior farming knowledge. They just have to come in, train a little bit with us, have some familiarity with technology, and they're up and running and they're a farmer. So to talk a little bit more about what this actually means, we think about our system as having a couple of key pieces to it. And the first is the ability to control, and the second is the ability to measure and actually sense itself. So we have the ability. Tom can control the temperature, he can control the humidity in the farm, he can control CO2, lighting, so things like how much day and how much night do our plants get, what intensity do the lights get, even the spectrum of the light itself, what nutrients are our crops getting? All of these variables which never before have been accessible for anybody in agriculture to control are not only available for Tom to control, but he can control them at an extraordinarily granular level. He has real-time control that allows him to make changes at that moment, minute by minute, hour by hour, day by day, week by week. And so that means Tom's not only exercising control on a crop level, but Tom can make changes as a crop develops. Because what a crop needs early in its life is not what a crop needs in the middle of its life, and oftentimes is not what a crop needs later in its life as well. Now the other advantage that Tom has at his fingertips is scale. So if you think about a traditional farm, best case, you're getting about six crop cycles a year, but it really is usually much lower than that. One, two, three crop cycles a year, maybe. In fact, for those that know, Warren Buffett's son, Howard Buffett, is actually a farmer. And he wrote a book recently called 40 Chances. And the entire premise of this book was as a farmer, you have 40 chances. You have 40 shots, 40 crops, 40 seasons to make it happen and make it work. That is not a lot of time. Now compare that to Bowery, where we have hundreds of thousands of crop cycles every single year, and we have tens of thousands of different learning opportunities that are happening where we can understand the interplay between all of these different variables we were just talking about and their effects on the crops that we grow. It is a completely new way to think about agriculture and is essentially what we call science at scale. So, there are a lot of implementations of artificial intelligence across what we do and what we've built at Bowery. So what I wanted to do was look at, at one single instance, and that is a crop recipe. So first and foremost, if I'm you, I'm saying I don't understand what is a crop recipe. And when I think about a recipe, I think about Chef Tom Colicchio, who's actually a partner of ours and has been for a long time. And so Chef Colicchio wants to make a dish and he's got these spices and that spices and these ingredients and he puts them all together and he cooks something which is inevitably going to be a lot better than anything that I'm possibly going to cook and there you have a dish. But when you imagine what a recipe for a crop is, it doesn't make a lot of sense. Because if you think about Farmer Tom, what his recipe was for a long time, 10,000 years ago, was I got a seed, I'm in a place, I know what the weather is in the soil, I'm going to plant my seed. Over time, his recipe got somewhat more sophisticated. He could put chemicals down, he could put fertilizers down, he could even change the genetics of his seeds, but it was pretty limited what he could do. Now you look at the power of what we have at Bowery. We have the ability to change all of these different variables, not only over the course of a crop's life, but different variables at different times in the course of a crop's life. So you can change the temperature that a crop needs, or you can change the humidity that that crop is getting. You can change the nutrients that crop gets. You can change the irrigation itself, the depth and the way it flows. You can change the lighting, how much day, how much night, all of these different variables, but there are so many different variables and a crop is an ecosystem in and of itself. So when you change one variable, you have to understand how the other variables change. This is a high dimensional search problem. 
You can imagine that if you tried to rely on individuals manually trying to make all these changes and keep track of what was happening and the result of it, it would be next to impossible. It would be impossible to manage. And this is where we not only rely on the AI side of our recipe search, but we also rely on our computer vision itself. So not only are we making changes to the crops, but we are actually watching to understand what happens when we make these changes. What is the effect of the changes that we're making on the crops themselves? So on the left or right, depending on where you guys are, I guess the left, what you're seeing is our, our algorithm is actually understanding what is plant and what's not plant. And they're watching our crop grow and understanding how quickly does it grow, where is it growing, how healthy, what kind of density, what kind of mass are we seeing. And then on the other side, you're seeing these little red boxes that are appearing. And what they're finding is small purple issues on the tips of our arugula leaves. And so our system can now go back and say, OK, we see these issues. How do I correlate these issues? to the recipe that we've given this crop, and what tweaks and changes do I want to make to that recipe so the next time I grow this crop, I don't have these same issues? This is a multi-armed bandit problem. So for those not familiar with what a multi-armed bandit problem is, we're, we're in Vegas, so let's imagine an octopus shows up at the Aria Casino. So other than being bizarrely strange that an octopus would be in the desert at the Aria Casino, this octopus really likes to play the slot machines. And obviously, like all of us, he comes to Vegas and he's got dreams of being a big winner. So he shows up and he comes into the slot machines and he starts pulling slot machines with all his arms. And then he finds one slot machine that pays better than all the others. And so he starts pulling that one even more. But while he's pulling that slot machine, he's using all of his other arms to pull other slot machines to find if maybe there's another slot machine that will pay even better than the one he's found. So he's exploiting the slot machine that pays well while he's exploring all of the other slot machines that are out there to try to find a better one. We do the exact same thing with our recipe search at Bowery. You can see here two recipes, the blue recipe and the purple recipe. And we start off and we watch both of these recipes. And over time, as these recipes go, we see that one is outperforming the other, the blue recipe. So we move to the blue recipe and we start exploiting the blue recipe. And while we're exploiting that blue recipe, we begin to explore other recipes. In this case, we're, explore, we're exploring and we find that violet recipe. And then we began looking at that violet recipe and many other recipes until we decide that violet recipe is actually even better. And we start exploiting the violet recipe. And then we continue this process over and over again, tens of thousands of times, with, with many, many, many variables in ways, again, that have never been possible in traditional field agriculture. And what this means then is instead of your R&D efforts being constrained to the size of the R&D team you have, the R&D budget that you have, or the number of test plots that you have out in the field, the only constraint for us is the number of farms that we actually have. So why does it matter? Why should all of you care about what we are doing? Why does it matter for the way we feed ourselves and the way we're going to feed the future generations? The challenge with Farmer Tom has always been that he's, that he's one person. And Farmer Tom's knowledge, people will tell you, is good for about a 10 square mile radius. He knows the weather in that area, he knows the land in that area, but you move him somewhere far away and his knowledge isn't that much good. So 10,000 years ago we see Tom and he's able to feed a very small village, a really small community with the technology that he has at his fingertips. It takes him almost 8,000 years of development before Tom himself can actually feed large towns and even small cities. And then it isn't until about 100 years ago that Tom, over the course of the last, decade, last 100 years, has even been able to feed countries. The problem is, in the effort to feed larger and larger populations, Tom is destroying the very resource that he relies on to feed that community itself. And this is why the Bowery operating system is so important. It is the connective tissue and the fabric that sits between all of our farms. Because what we are building at Bowery is a distributed network of farms. And every new farm we build now will have the knowledge and understanding of every single crop we've ever grown at Bowery, every single process we've ever run. So when that farm opens, it's smarter than any farm we've ever opened before. 
And then that farm itself begins to create data and begins to create optimizations that it also puts, pushes back into the center of our system. And that system has more and more data. It learns faster and faster, and it pushes those optimizations back out into the network. And so the larger that network gets and the more data that network has, the stronger, more powerful, and more effective it becomes. What that means then is the farmer Tom of today and tomorrow looks drastically different than the farmer Tom of yesterday. And the, farmers, and the farms of today and tomorrow look drastically different than the farms of yesterday. And it means that we have the opportunity to grow fresh, high quality, local, pesticide-free food in every city around the world so we can create not only a more efficient, but a much more sustainable future that will protect this generation, but many, many more generations to come. Thank you very much.